Mark chapter 6, verses 14 through 20. King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some were saying, John the baptizer has been raised from the dead, and for this reason these powers are at work in him. But others said, it is Elijah. And others said, it is a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For Herod himself had sent men who arrested John, bound him, and put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because Herod had married her. For John had been telling Herod, It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to kill him, but she could not. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he protected him. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he liked to listen to him. The reading of Mark chapter 6, verses 21 through 29. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his courtiers and officers and for the leaders of Galilee. When his daughter Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it. And he solemnly swore to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give you, even half of my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, What should I ask for? She replied, The head of John the baptizer. Immediately she rushed back to the king and requested, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was deeply grieved, yet out of regard for his oaths, and for the guests, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately, the king sent a soldier of the guard with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison, brought his head on a platter, and gave it to the girl. Then the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard about it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. May God bless the reading, hearing, and understanding of these words this morning. Yeah, we're going to talk about beheading John the Baptist. Not really a scripture you would think about hearing on a Sunday morning. There's not much hope in this scripture. There's not much happiness, positivity in this scripture But this is a scripture that we kind of need to hear. It's a very interesting scene in the Bible. And it's one that has been depicted through the arts all through the years. If you turn to the front of your bulletin, there is a painting there. And in that platter is John the Baptist's head. And this is not the only painting. There are many paintings by many famous artists that have done this. There have been scenes written about it in plays. There's been all sorts of things about this scene. It's important for us to understand this. It's important for us to look at Herod and his actions and figure out what was going on. It's important for us to understand why John put this in, why Mark, excuse me, put this in the gospel. And so we'll begin. It opens our story this morning by saying that Jesus' name has begun to spread across the land and he is becoming well known. We know this. We have followed Jesus for the past few weeks on his journey. We've seen the people he has healed, the teachings that he has given in the synagogues, the calming of the storm on the boat. And now all of these acts are coming back and they're being spread across and they are getting to the ear of Herod. And he is beginning to learn about Jesus. This religious figure that is making his name in the world by speaking about the new kingdom of God that is coming. 
this religious teacher that is showing new ways of serving the Lord in this world, this person who is changing the way that things have been done for years ago, for years and years. And so, as always happens, as always does, comparisons happen. And so you compare one to another, and they started doing that. Some say it was Elijah. Some say that Jesus is the second coming of another prophet from old, and others still say that it is John the Baptist come back. And it's the comparison to John the Baptist that gives pause to Herod. Because as we find out later, in just a a sentence later, Herod beheaded John the Baptist. And then he flashes back and he tells a story. He remembers the cruel act that he committed against John. We understand that John was arrested for, in Mark chapter 1, verse 14, we read this. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. Just like that. That was all it was. In the first chapter of Mark, we met John the Baptist. He baptized Jesus, and then all of a sudden, he's arrested. And we hear nothing more until now in chapter 6. Nothing about what happened, what went on, just a quick aside. Just a, hey, by the way, in case you were wondering what happened to this guy we talked about a couple of sentences ago, he's arrested, enough said. But now we get the story. Now we get the details between Herod and John. For it seems that John is now, has been speaking out against the marriage of Herod to his brother's wife. John, speaking out so that Herod and others could hear, telling that the marriage was not legal and violated the law that was written in Leviticus 18.16. And it angered Herodias. Didn't anger Herod. But it angered his wife. Now I'm not married, but I understand that if one is angry, then the other one sure as heck better be. And so Herod's wife is mad and angered. And he, she ordered, she said, you've got to kill this man. You have to kill him. But Herod couldn't. He could not kill John the Baptist. For it said in our scripture that Herod knew that John was a righteous and a holy man. And he protected him. So part of this arrest might have been Herod saying, if I don't do something, she might. So I'm going to arrest him. I'm going to keep him here where I can keep him safe. Because if I don't, he might die. And there's no reason for him to die. Herod knew that there was no reason. He knew that he could not give an explanation as as to why he had John the Baptist murdered. And so he kept him safe. He kept him locked up, arrested, but all the time he kept going down and visiting John, talking to him, listening, and liking what John had to say. But his wife did not like this person. And so Herod's birthday arrives. Invitations are sent out and everybody agrees to come. And why not? This is one of the most powerful people in the land. So all the officers, the courtiers, the leaders of Galilee are all gathered around Herod. And Herod was in his element. He is a politician. He loves this. He loves the big crowds, the people all around him, probably giving him praise probably lavishing nothing but complimentary words upon him. And he's loving this. He's having a great time. Who wouldn't enjoy something like that? And the wine starts to flow and the people get happy, maybe a little looser than they normally would. 
and they're just sitting around talking, and then Herod's daughter comes, and she gives a dance for the guest. Now, I don't know for sure, but what I have read and what I understand, this was not just a little line dance that she performed for these gentlemen. This was kind of like a sensual dance. And so the, the gentlemen are there, and they're like, all right, look at this. And they are enjoying the dance. And so now Herod getting a little bit more prideful. Well, his ego is going up a little bit, looking around and going, look at all these people. Look at how much they love me. Look at how much they love my family. Oh, man, there is nothing that gives you more pride than seeing people gush over your children. And so now his head is getting bigger. And he wants to impress the people more, wants to impress his daughter. And so he says to her, anything you want, just ask, and it's yours. He was showing off at that point. He didn't think about what the ramifications of his actions could lead to. Just living in the moment. Wanting to show off in front of his friends and the other leaders of Galilee there at the party. But it backfires on him. For the first thing the daughter does is go to her mother Herodias and says, What should I ask for? And Herodias immediately responds, ask for the head of John the Baptizer. And so the daughter goes and asks Herod for the head of the John the Baptizer on a platter, and he obliged. But listen to what the scriptures say. In six, chapter, chapter 6, verse 26, it says this of Herod. The king was deeply grieved, yet out of regard for his oath and his guests, he did not want to refuse her. Herod did not want to kill this man. Herod did not want to have any, to have any part about this, for there was no reason to harm this man, except that someone else wanted it done. But now he feels like he has to. He feels that there is nothing else to do. I've already said this in front of everybody else. I can't lose face right now. What will they think of me then? He gave his oath. And he spoke out in front of others of that anything that she wanted would happen. To show that he had power. That he was an important person, that others should look to him in awe and in wonder, he had to follow through. He could not lose face. So out of political ambition, social pressure, and just pure ego, he ordered the head of John the Baptist to be delivered on a platter. A politician ordered the death of a religious figure just for speaking out. Sound familiar? Robert Bryant wrote this. Mark's accounts of John's death at the command of Herod Antipas and Jesus' death by the order of Pontius Pilate have much in common. Both rulers looked favorably favorably upon their captive, who were prominent religious figures. Each ruler desires to spare the life of his prisoner, but both care more about pleasing their constituencies than exercising judgment. Both act against their better judgment and, con and condemn to death innocent men. Both of these leaders knew what they were doing was wrong, because, but because they wanted to keep power and they wanted to please all of those people around them, they decided that justice no longer mattered. All that mattered was making sure their power stayed the same. How many times in our lives do we make decisions only after deciding how it's going to affect us and only us. 
How many times do we sit back and let other people make decisions that you know are not the just decision, are not the decisions that God is wanting us to make into this world? Some of the choices that we make are to help us. They are. And I'm not saying that you should go and not make any decisions or make decisions that go against your own self-preservation. But it should not be the only reason we make decisions. We need to continue to make our decisions with the idea of helping God's transformation of this world. Because the decisions we make today will affect what comes in the future. If everyone thinks only of themselves in every decision that is made, then the world is not going to have a very bright future. We may not like everyone. We may not like what everyone says, but it is not up to us to use our power to make sure that they no longer can say it. It is up to us to make sure that God's word is here to transform the world. Herod, in our story, at the very beginning, is now hoping, hoping more than hope, that this person, Jesus, is John the Baptist, the second coming. Because it would give him another chance to make the right decision. Not to give in to pressure, not to listen to others around him, but make the decision that he knows is just and righteous. But this was not the case. And it is not often the case in our lives that second chances appear. They do sometimes and we get a chance to correct a wrong that was made. But many times we don't. Many times we have to live with the decisions that we make each and every day. And so wouldn't it be easier just to make the decisions that are good for us, yes, but are also good for everyone else. Often our decisions will affect others in some form or fashion. We just might not be able to see it in the moment. So we keep that in mind as we go. As we walk throughout this world and we think about the decisions that we are making, we think in our heads, how will this transform the world to God's image? How will this help God's kingdom come faster? Our decisions are to be made for the betterment of this world, for the betterment of society, not solely for the betterment of ourselves. I want to quote Robert Bryant one more time when he said, Mark may also be drawing a sharp contrast between the fading kingdom of the Herods, a kingdom marked by pride, jealousy, cruelty, and death, and the emerging kingdom of God under the rule of Jesus and his disciples, a kingdom marked by courageous, the courageous faithfulness, even to death, as well as life and nourishing friendship, fellowship, excuse me. So let us join in. Let us go out and proclaim the emerging kingdom of God that is coming in this world. A kingdom that is not marked by jealousy, pride, cruelty, or death. Let us allow that kingdom to go away. And God's kingdom that is welcoming. The new kingdom that we can all be brought together. Let us welcome this kingdom together with nourishing fellowship. Amen.